the new empire calls itself the rule of law. So I thought it's maybe good to try to explain, from my point of view, what is the meaning of the, true of, of the rule of law, what are its limits or should be its limits, and what is the abuse of the rule of law in the new empire. For the meaning of the rule of law, although I'm in Rome here, I would like to go back to ancient Athens, which was not an empire. And there is a wonderful little book by a French philosopher, Philippe Nemo, Qu'est-ce que l'Occident? He says the first basis of freedom is the rule of law in the Greek sense, the nomocracy, that we are governed on the basis of general rules, not by the will of the powerful, not by mere decision, but rules that are predetermined in advance and then applied by judges. And the second element is the equality before the law, that everybody is subject to the same law, even if the law can differentiate between different people, between different uh, situations, evidently. But that protects us against corruption. And the third characteristic is that the law is not immutable, but should change slowly as collective reason of ages and by democratic means, democratic legitimate institutions that may change the law. And that is what we call the separation of powers, that we have a legislator who is not judging and that we have judges who are not legislating. That is the true meaning of the rule of law, that the judges cannot change the law and that legislators cannot... cannot... Ah, it's back. cannot abolish our fundamental freedoms. That is the traditional balance of the rule of law. However, we do not respect the limits of the rule of law anymore. Judges are not only interpreting the law and also developing it, and sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes we are even happy that judges have set aside anomalies because the parliaments were too lazy or malfunctioning. We must be so honest to accept that, that this is true. But this is only legitimate if it can be corrected. It's not so problematic when judges give false interpretations of statutes. It's much more problematic when they give interpretations of constitutions, which cannot be changed or only very difficultly be changed. And it's even more problematic when judges base their making the law on international treaties that are even more difficult to change, like the European Union treaties or the European Convention on Human Rights. That makes it more problematic. And what real legal science tends to see nowadays, and I'm referring, for example, to a wonderful book by the Harvard Law Professor Adrian Vermeule, from Dutch descent, but long ago, eh, who says that, after all, parliaments are in a better position to make the law than judges. Because we always have the argument, these people are educated, they are intelligent, they've studied, and, and these parliaments are populated by elected people who don't know anything about it, he shows that it's better to make laws in Parliament, that they have more information, more diversity, and more expertise from diverse nature. So that's the epistemological argument. A third limit is evidently the law cannot do everything. Quid leges sine moribus. We need the common people to be educated, the wisdom of the common people to save us, which is more important uh, than the wisdom of the few. Fourthly, the law cannot solve everything. Many questions are political questions and we should not entrust them to judges. They should be decided by democratic institutions. And indeed, sometimes, huh, if we fight the empire, the solution is to secede. That's what the Americans did, fighting in the Declaration of Independence, fighting against foreign judges. That's what caused the Brexit to some extent. Secession is an instrument of self-determination, whether it was our ancestors in the Netherlands in the 16th century, whether it is in the United States, whether it's Brexit, or whether it's secession in Scotland or Catalonia. Because I would like to ask my fellow conservatives to be coherent in their anti-imperialism. If we fight the European empire, we should only also recognize the self-determination of the smaller nations among us, 
which is not always respected by some of the anti-imperialists. <laughs> Next limit, important limit to the rule of law and to the law is that in a pluralistic world, there should not be a single instance that has the last word. We need a plurality of institutions, political and judiciary, but also different courts that can fight with each other and that preferably go into a dialogue with each other instead of trying to have as the only one the last word as some courts, especially European Court of Justice, are trying to do. This requires committee from judges. That's an ancient and very important word. The committee between nations, but also the committee by judges and the committee between courts to dialogue with the other ones, the dialogue between European courts and national courts, for example, or between the different national courts. And that should include a fundamental difference also for the next generation and for democratic lawmaking. We should not allow people to impose on the next generation their own values if they do not accept to be bound by the values of the earlier generation. Some things can be changed, yes. But if, if you say this is human right, but we're changing it, we're inventing it, how can it be a human right if it has not been accepted for 2,000 years? And how do you dare to say to the next 2,000 years, now you're going to follow my interpretation of what is human right? Please, a little bit of modesty would be better. <laughs> and last, last point before pointing in my last minute to some abuse, last point on the limits of the law. There is a rhetoric in the European Union and international circles, in global environments, that when something is really important, when, when something is fundamental, when we are dealing with fundamental values, that they should be the same everywhere. Well, that is wrong. Because if something is about fundamental values, it means that we are fundamentally divided about them. And that it's legitimate that different people have different ideas. We are emotionally and rationally divided over fundamental questions. And if that's the case, that means that you should not centralize a solution, but decentralize it. I've learned that from Antonin Scalia, who explained why it was a stupid thing to try to impose the same rule on abortion in the 50 states of America. Since then, the majority of Americans are unhappy. Before that, everybody had its own rule in its own state, and most people were happy with the state they lived in. Decentralize fundamental questions in necessaries diversitas, not unitas. I've learned that from Scalia. The model, the model that respects the rule of law in its real sense for me is the Swiss Confederation. That's not an empire. That's a country built up from the bottom in a very decentralized way. And then my last minute, the abuse of the rule of law not respecting these limits, uh, finds its expression, I think, mainly in three things to conclude. First, imposing new rights against democratic majorities and forbidding democratic change to abolish them. That's the first thing with human rights, mainly. Secondly, organizing global governance, trying to bind the nations by all kinds of international soft law and hard law instruments and pacts and principles that have been made by NGOs and sometimes by governments and that then proclaimed as being the truth, the scientific truth. And we see that on migration, for example, which was a big thing, the Marrakesh Pact for in our country, that's a typical example of binding nations by soft law uh, and then making uh, judgments about it afterwards. And finally, there is the example of what I cannot call but paranoia. Judges, good judges, try to avoid the pitfalls, a small path between on the one hand the schizophrenia and on the other hand the paranoia. And the schizophrenia means that a text can mean anything, that every interpretation is possible. A and the paranoia, and that's the last thing, and the paranoia means that there's only one 
monopolistic position that is left and that your authority can never be questioned. And that's what the European Court of Justice has done in recent years in very different examples. The Gauweiler case of the German Constitutional Court, they just laughed with the Germans. The Achmea case where they said, no, international arbitration, we don't take that into account. All these treaties, only the European Court of Justice has the last word. Or the case against the Polish justice reform where they simply set aside the Polish constitution.